Today is January 24th, 2023, and my guest is Marco Ramos, MD, PhD, historian of medicine and psychiatrist at Yale University. Marco, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you so much for inviting me, Russ. I'm delighted to be here. Our topic for today is an article you wrote last spring uh, for the Boston Review, and you were reviewing two histories of psychiatry, and the, the title of the article um, really grabbed my attention, Mental Illness Is Not In Your Head. Now, you may not have written that title. Usually authors don't get to write their own titles, but uh, that's what your article is about. And for interested listeners, uh, we've done a bunch of related Econ Talk episodes on this topic with Gary Greenberg, uh, Louis Menand, and more recently, Owen Hari, and you can find those in our archive. We'll link to them with this episode. So I want to start with a quote. You said uh, the following, and quote, in 1990, President George Bush announced that a new era of discovery was dawning in brain research. Over the next several decades, the U.S. government poured billions of dollars into science that promised to revolutionize our understanding of psychiatric disorders from depression and bipolar disorder to schizophrenia. Scientists imagined that mental illnesses in the future might be diagnosed with genetic tests, a simple blood draw, or perhaps a scan of your brain. New pharmaceuticals would target specific neurochemical imbalances, resulting in more effective treatments. The 1990s, Bush declared, would be remembered as the decade of the brain. Marco, how did that turn out? Yeah, thanks Thanks again so much for having me, Russ, to discuss uh, this important topic. Um, it didn't turn out, is the truth. And in many ways, um, exactly that hope uh, for a biological future for psychiatry is what drove me personally into the profession itself. You know, I, I grew up in the 1990s, and I was looking at all of the sort of promises that were coming with some of the drugs that were coming out to treat depression, um, as well as schizophrenia. Uh, there were sort of neuro, uh, shiny, colorful pictures of the brain that were coming out uh, on, on TV and sort of educational programs, as well as from our president, as you just outlined. And that's part of what pushed me, my interest into mental health. Um, I actually, uh, in college, uh, I was doing neuroimaging research um, on aging. But unfortunately, now that I'm sort of on the other side of training, I've really found that um, biology has very little to do with um, my day-to-day -day practice. So when I treat patients every week um, and I prescribe a, an antidepressant, for example, for depression, and a patient asks me a very simple and reasonable question about how does this drug actually work in the brain? Um, why do we think biologically it's going to help my depression that I'm experiencing? I don't have good answers, um, and we don't really have good answers. We do know some of the things that those drugs do in your brain, but the things that they do in your brain has not been linked to an improvement in a given patient's mood. Um, really, you know, a, a lot of what we know is, particularly with respect to pharmaceuticals, this trial and error. Um, and that's the case, you know, as I was just saying, for antidepressants, but really for pharmaceuticals across the board, we're not really sure why they help people. But the myth, right, that the reason that they're helping people is because they're targeting some underlying biological reality that undergirds mental illnesses um, continues to get propagated, has made pharmaceutical companies lots of money, has made academic researchers careers. Um, and so the piece in many ways was actually leaning on these two books to take a step back and say, what do we actually know about the biological reality of mental disorders. And it turns out we, we know very little. And you write about this. It's certainly, you know, I'm older than you. I've, I've watched this field evolve over time. And there, there is a desperate desire to treat mental illness like physical illness. They both share the word illness. And physical illness, we can see a tumor. Uh, we can uh, find a parasite, we can find a, a bacteria, uh, and we often have a mechanism for, for fighting those. Uh, 
the hope was that this would also happen here. And as you say, and as other guests have come on and said, uh, there is this, you know, I'd call it, um, I, I think Gary Greenberg calls it a noble lie or a, uh, you could call it mm. a, a a piece of folklore. Mm. Well, there's some, there's an imbalance in the, a chemical imbalance in the brain. The problem is we have not been able to link any measured chemical imbalance with uh, the disorders we're trying to treat, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's exactly the issue. Um, it would be great. Um, and, and I am, you know, I would, again, part of the reason that drove me into psychiatry originally was the hope for, for a biological test that if you came in and told me you were suffering depressive symptoms, I could measure perhaps something in your blood. Uh, we could send you for a scan, any sort of uh, what's sort of in literature called a biomarker that we could have a biomarker that we could use to say definitively, you have this condition. And because just like we have biomarkers, for example, for diabetes, as you've suggested, or we have sort of genetic markers for different kinds of cancer that determine what treatment we're going to use, we could have something similar for mental illness. And the truth is, we just don't have that. But we keep trying to shove mental illness into this biomedical frame, into this biomedical box, despite the lack of progress on this front in many ways over the course of the last half century, we suffer, I think, in many ways in academic psychiatry from a lack of imagination, from being able to see a frame for psychiatry that's not this sort of very narrow and rigid biomedical um, structure that we're sort of just continually trying to, to shove psychiatry into. And we'll come back later and talk about some alternative perspectives that, that sure. you outlined, which are you know very provocative, because when, once you have a title, uh, mental illness is not in your brain, the next question is going to be, well, where the heck is Wait, it? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and and we'll talk about that. But I want to continue to uh, talk a little bit about more of what we might call this. Um, it's tempting to call it meta science. It's not meta, though. It's not science. It's fake science or, you know, I don't know, narrative to help people. But it also helps make people rich. So they have an incentive to lie about it. Um, this idea that that there's an imbalance or a uh, an inadequate amount of some chemical and that a pharmaceutical drug might uh, correct that is deeply appealing for all kinds of reasons. And, okay. and when, when I have spoken about this before with guests, many listeners will angrily, angrily write in, fill in the blank, some pharmaceutical they've been uh, taking for some time, save my life. I was depressed, I was suicidal, but since I've been taking blank, I'm much better. So on on one level, and certainly for certain people, these drugs that even though we don't understand how they work, mm -hmm. seem to work. Now, some of it could be a, a placebo effect. Uh, some of it could be if you'd prescribed nothing over some period of time, the symptoms would have abated anyway. But there are many, many people and many doctors uh, will tell you you're, all that is true, what, what we've been saying for the first few minutes of this conversation. But that does not change the fact that these pharmaceuticals help people. Do you agree or disagree? I, and what kind of numbers? No. If you, what kind of numbers are we yeah. talking about? Yeah, that's great. Um, and and that's uh, I'm I'm really glad you you sort of brought this point up for us um, because I think it's it's a it's an important distinction between does a drug work? In other words. When we give a pharmaceutical for depression, does it help someone's depression? That's one question. And then on the other side, the question of how does the drug work? What we've been talking up to this point is all about how does the drug work? It's been touted, as we've been, say, been saying, that it works biologically, but we re really don't know the answer to that. And so you brought up the question of do these drugs work? And I absolutely believe these drugs work for certain people. I think the data show, the best data that we have, um, shows that uh, it's about 30% of people who take them will, who, who meet criteria for depression as we define it, will have some sort of benefit on their mood um, because of the drug. If you add placebo on top of that, it's approaching like 60%. Now, when I'm treating a patient in front of me, I don't really care if they're getting better because of placebo or because it's, quote unquote, really the drug. I just care that they're getting better. So I also share that with my patients. So that patient 
who's sitting in front of me and saying, how does this drug work? I'm very open. I said, you know what? We really don't know exactly how or why this drug helps certain people. We do know it helps about 60%. And then I, I break it down for them, just like I just did for you here. So I use these drugs uh, on a weekly basis for, with, with my patients because I found that I think they do help them. Now, it's frustrating because I, I think we need to divorce these two ideas, right? Just because we d- we're saying we don't know how this drug works biologically does not mean we need to throw out the drugs altogether, right? So I think, I think there's, there's plenty of middle ground between those two positions. The problem I have, I think, is that this myth or this noble lie, as Gary Greenberg uh, put it, keeps getting touted um, instead of academic psychiatrists as well as pharmaceutical companies sort of taking uh, a more humble and honest position and just leveling with people and saying, we don't know how these drugs work, um, but they seem to work for this percentage of people. And we have good evidence that they do. And so we should continue to use them. It reminds me a little bit of the story. It's t- I heard it told about Enrico Fermi. It's told about Niels Bohr. So I think it's probably told about Einstein. Soon it comes into the this great scientist's office and there's a horseshoe over the door and the student says, Professor Fermi, you, you don't believe in that, do you? And he said, oh, of course not. But they say it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> and, and there's an aspect of this that's, that, capt- that, that captures, but the part that's disturbing is, of course, that for some people, say 60% or 30%, if you take out the placebo effect, it works for a while. And and it doesn't work for very long and it requires they change the dose or you add a different, a cocktail or you try it, you substitute. And then the second, of course, equally worrisome problem is that there's serious side effects to many Mm -hmm. of these drugs and they are, it's not, they're not small. It's not like, um, uh, you know, the the ads you hear on TV, you know, could include uh, indigestion or, or, um, Mm -hmm discomfort. There's some terrible side effects for some people, these drugs. So talk about those two issues. Yeah, I I mean, absolutely. And I'm going to talk about the side effects at the individual level, but then I'm also going to back up about how and and just reflect on how this myth has affected how we understand our mental health, right? Just more broadly, which I think is is in some ways the larger uh, damage um, that that it's caused in our society. But you're absolutely right. These drugs have um, some tremendous side effects. Um, uh, For example, um, certain uh, what are called second generation antipsychotics, um, which are often used either for schizophrenia, but they can also be used for in conjunction with antidepressants for mood. They can cause diabetes. And it's worth, um, and, and in fact, if you use them long enough, they inevitably will cause diabetes. It's not really a question. It's just a, it's just a matter of how long you use them. Um, and sure, you know, the guidelines say we should measure for it and we should like track if someone's developing diabetes and all these certain things, but we know that it's going to give the person diabetes if we continue to use these drugs in the long term. Um, and you really have to have a conversation with the patient about these sort of longer term side effects that they may have. Um, And you really have to take a step back and wonder, like, is it worth it? Like, is it worth giving this patient a condition, a medical condition that they did not have before so that we can address this particular issue? And this feeds into that larger point that I was making is really what pharmaceutical companies capitalized on with this myth of the biological reality of mental illness is that the solution to our subjective psychic distress in society is a pill, right? The reason that you are not, and this is exactly what all the ads, right? So I'm teaching a course on the history of drugs right now uh, at the undergraduate level here at Yale. And we're talking about how in the 1980s, um, as uh, direct-to-consumer advertising for pharmaceuticals became legal for the first time in the United States, pharma capitalized on that by saying we can create demand for psychopharmaceuticals by convincing people with television ads, with print ads, 
that the subjective distress that you're feeling in your everyday life, you think it has to do with your job. You think it has to do with your relationships. It doesn't have to do with any of that. It has to do with your brain. It has to do with the neurochemical imbalances that you're suffering from. And the only solution to that is a pill. And that heavy advertising and then the sort of market that developed along it has in many ways created a society, particularly for people, uh, I think in, in many ways who have privilege, who have access to doctors, et cetera, where when you're not feeling well, one of the first things you sort of ask yourself is like, should I be on a drug? And that sort of individualized approach, biological, if you will, in, in scare quotes, quote, approach to our mental health is in many ways, I think, the legacy, the larger legacy of this sort of myth of the biological reality of mental illness, that the way that we need to approach our emotional and psychological problems in our everyday life is to go to a doctor and to get a pill. And that approach forecloses a lot of other questions, a lot of other ways of understanding mental health, um, and in that, in many ways, it's is I think the larger uh, result of of this of this myth. Well, you said you know it's not your job, it's not your relationship, it's in your brain. And Gary Greenberg would say, yeah, of course it's in your brain. Where else would it be? But the question is where it right. come from, and and what's the best way to That's cope right. with it? And and the um, the pill idea. Uh, you know, I think of it as sort of a, one of my favorite cartoons is the person who whose car is on the, by the side of the road and the hood is up. And I think it's one of the passengers is looking under the hood and the second one comes out to check on it. And the person looking under the hood says, I think I know the problem. And under the hood is a giant on off switch and it's set to <laughs> off. So, you know, it's easy to fix. Just put it back on, on, you know, and you're you're depressed or you're unhappy or you have anxiety or you're stressed out or you're sad. Just give me the pill. I don't, I don't, I don't like to suffer. And I think, you know, I've never really spoken about this on the program, but I, I, I suspect some of the cultural um, sympathy that, that we have for this idea that a pill is better to deal with this is a reaction to the pre-enlightenment age view of suffering, which mm. was it's a punishment from God, say, mm. or mm-hmm. uh, or you're uh, you have bad luck or some, quote, non-scientific uh, explanation. And the idea that it's actually in the brain and it's a chemical mm-hmm. thing somehow mm-hmm. is seen as an advance. And I think the, that one of the deep aspects of, of the way you write about this is is a realization uh, for me, even though I've thought about this for a long time, we'll come back and talk about this later, but realization for me that, that actually that's not helpful. Uh, it's not, yeah. it's not an advance. Yeah. Now it could be, right. Could be, but sure. so far, uh, it's, it, it's actually an illusion or a lie, uh, at least so far. And, and that is shocking at a certain level. Yeah. And I'm sure your patients go like, and, and Johan Hari has written about this, like, what, what what do you mean? It's not a chemical. You don't know how it works. I mean, of course, <laughs> exactly. it's science. It's a pill. It's it's the switch. You found the switch that was on the yeah. wrong setting. That's and right. You fixed it. This fixes oh, it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and absolutely. And and but what I will say is that I found that people really actually appreciate the honesty and education. And I think there's a pressure on the professional side to particularly in psychiatry, which always has felt sort of, is it a part of mainstream medicine or is it not? It's always occupied this kind of marginal relationship. Um, well, that's not true. I'm a historian. So there were there were moments where psychiatry was more mainstream, but at least now, especially in, in certainly for the last, I would say, half century, it's occupied this somewhat marginal position that has pushed uh, academic psychiatrists and psychiatrists' profession to act like uh, we're just doctors like everyone else. Um, and in, in some ways to, to sort of peddle these lies or lean on them when we can to sort of, you know, make ourselves feel like we're, we're, we're specialists, just like if you were to see a kidney doctor. But I found that 
Um, that sort of openness and honesty, while it is without a doubt, patients are coming to mind who are just look at me incredulously and are sort of like, is it that you don't know like how they work and like other psychiatrists do, or do we really just not know? Um, and then, you know, we, we have a conversation about it, but then I'm also very honest about the data on efficacy and how, you know, I really do it, but feel like it's going to help them. Um, I also, as, as a historian, want to take a little bit of a step back about when is it, because we often think of the sort of 1980s and 1990s as when pharmaceutical companies started pushing out the first antidepressants. But really, the first blockbuster psychopharmaceutical was in the 1950s. Um, and it was a drug that now really uh, doesn't exist, at least under this trade name called Milltown, Armaprobamate. Um, and it was a drug that came out in, in the 1950s, was a huge blockbuster drug, and was it's specifically the first time that pharmaceutical companies started to realize, uh, and this is in the wake of like very effective medical drugs coming out. So like penicillin, the Salk vaccine for polio, all of a sudden you have this moment where pharma is realizing prescription drug markets are where the money's at, right? Not over-the-counter stuff. Like we have these effective drugs now. But it's with Milltown that they start to think, we can have a drug that doesn't just treat a disease in their body. We don't have to wait for people to get sick to make money from the drugs they take. Instead, we can use this drug, Milltown, that treats people's anxiety, particularly upper middle class, white collar professionals and their families. Right. So um, the, the image that they had in Milltown specifically, we're sort of familiar with Mother's Little Helper, perhaps in Valium in the 1970s. But Milltown in the 1950s was really targeting the white collar uh, businessman and professional who's got high demands for productivity. Right. Like going to his job, it's super stressful. The solution, right, that the pharmaceutical company offers you at this time is not to say, do I need a new job? Or not to say, you know, how can I like, I, do I need to sit down and talk with my boss? No, none of those things, right? If you take this pill, you'll feel better and you'll continue to be as productive as you need to be. And I think that underlying, which is the sort of origin of what has been called in the literature, lifestyle drugs, right? These drugs that are designed not to treat a sickness or illness medically in your body, but are designed to sort of optimize your life in a particular way. These lifestyle drugs that were designed really in many ways, and this is as American as it gets, to make as productive as possible, right, in sort of business settings, still undergirds the ethos of a lot of sort of the, the drug culture, if you will, in the United States, where we think about drugs as ways to make a life that sort of sometimes makes us suffer, um, but we, we feel like we need to do it to be productive, to, to continue to thrive, what have you. It makes that life possible, right? Taking this drug makes the life possible. And I see this a lot with particularly my undergraduate students at a, at a sort of the pressure cooker that is a university like Yale. Which is weird because they all get A's, but doesn't matter. Some get A minuses. <laughs> oh, they and find ways to be competitive. <laughs> yeah, you'll find it. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, this is a crazy speculation. I've never read or heard this. I don't know if there's anything to it, but you know, my my dad worked an office job all his life. He he worked in in air defense, and and I think he was under a lot of stress in that job. And there was a long period of time where he smoked two to three packs of cigarettes a day. And I said, you know, at some point I asked him as a kid, you know, I just will mention as an aside, uh, you know, people say you should model things for your kids. There's modeling mm -hmm. and then there's anti-modeling. After watching my dad smoke, I have never smoked a cigarette in my mm -hmm. life and I've mm -hmm. of any kind, just for the record, mm -hmm. uh, because I was so turned off by his habit. Uh, and it, it had health consequences for him down the road. He lived to 89, thank God. But still, some of those years were unpleasant because of smoking. Sure. But, you know, I asked him something about why, you know, what was good about it. He said, well, it calms me down or, it, you know, mm -hmm. or it, it, it helps him. And um, I, I'm wondering, there, there are two things that are that are obviously true, one of which is 
pharmaceutical companies have been very good at getting the government to cover the out-of-pocket costs for consumers. So part of the reason that they can uh, be so successful with their drugs is because they're reaching into the pockets of taxpayers rather than the people who are taking the drugs. And I've talked about that many times on this program. I'll stop there. But the question I'm, I'm thinking about is the following. Uh, you give a number like one out of six Americans is on some sort of um, psychotherapeutic drug. And you certainly are, I'm certainly aware of the rise, especially among young young people, of drugs for anxiety, ADHD, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, various things that before were just treated as difficulties that are now treated as things, illnesses to be cured. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if the reduction in smoking, which was a palliative effect for some of the stress that we're talking about, uh, encouraged the demand for some of these alternatives. Anybody ever wrote, mm. think about that, write about that? Not that question in particular, but I like that kind of question. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak a little bit about it, it, which is that we often separate, and this is this is also a function of this sort of biomedicalized myth about the biological reality of these illnesses. We often separate exactly what you're bringing together. We separate drugs like cigarettes, right, which are not obviously we don't you know physicians don't prescribe them, right? You don't um, go to a pharmacy to get them. You get them at a gas station or whatever. We separate drugs like that from prescription drugs, right? That you go to, to, to your doctor to get, right? And, and we, we act like these two things are totally separate and distinct, right? One is for recreation. Sometimes they're illegal if they're, you know, too much fun or too dangerous or what have you. Um, and that's the sort of recreational drug market. And then we have the sort of medicalized market. And in that context, the drugs are used specifically to treat an illness. And you're a patient in that context, not like a drug user or a consumer. And in many ways, this, this division is, is altogether, while it has real consequences for people, in terms of the substances, it's false. Um, in my history of drugs class, I talk about how the same biochemical substance often crosses this line back and forth and back and forth. Tobacco, I mean, we've got to go a, a little bit farther back for tobacco. But in, um, in, you know, the sort of early modern period was, was thought of as a cure-all, even for things like cancer. And in fact, they would, um, they would uh, uh, t the first line intervention in France to resuscitate someone who was unconscious was to actually blow tobacco smoke through an enema, through their rectum into their intestines. Um, and there were all sorts of medical treatises written about tobacco. Obviously, it's crossed the line into recreational um, for a variety of important reasons. Um, but we can see this with opiates, right? Opiates for in many contexts have been used as uh, sort of prescriptions, but they're also used recreationally. Over the course of the last 200 years, they had opiates have pinged pong back and forth many, many times with dramatic consequences on people. So we need to see the boundary between this sort of medicalized market and this recreational drug market is extremely porous, and we should be suspicious of it, right? And I think your contention that we should see a, a history of cigarette use as a way for people to deal with the anxiety and stress of their everyday life, and a history of Milltown or Valium or other benzos as a way to deal with anxiety as part of the same history, right? What's, what's happening is people are anxious in their lives and they're turning to substances in different ways. Sometimes they're, th that happens through these recreational markets. Sometimes that happens through the medicalized market. But what pharmaceutical companies realize, for some of the reasons you were just saying, what is, is that if they can medicalize things that people are targeting with their recreational drug use, right? So like if I'm drinking alcohol because every, you know, to take the edge off, after work every day, right? If I can medicalize that, then there's a lot of money to be made there. Um, and there's, there's, there's a big market there that you can create and that you can continue to tap into. Yeah. I, and of course, the idea that a glass of wine is one, one, not two, 
not 1.7, <laughs> but one glass of red <laughs> wine could be good for your heart is the wine industry's counterpoint oh, yeah. to the cigarettes cause cancer. You should be taking Valium instead. Um, I can't help but think about uh, Noah in the book of Genesis, who after watching the entire world destroyed and everyone's dead except for his immediate family, which is a – it beats the alternative probably, but it's a jarring reality to face. The first thing he does is he plants a vineyard and gets – and passes out from alcohol. Yeah, exactly. And because – why? Because there are no antidepressants for him. He's – you know, the yeah. pharmaceutical company uh, – pharmaceutical industry hasn't come along yet. Anyway, um, before we move on to the alternative ways to think about this, which which we'll turn to next – I, I want to ask one thing about uh, CBT. Now, CBT yeah. often gets abbreviated that way as CBT. It right. stands for, I think, cognitive behavioral therapy, which yes. is a fancy word for talking. It's the um, the old school of psychoanalysis. You mentioned Freud in your article. For a while, there was an idea that we could talk to people. And if I remember correctly from, from Gary Greenberg, there is some evidence, maybe a lot of evidence, that CBT, talking, to a thoughtful person who can help you explore your the source of your anxiety or stress or depression or sadness can work as well as some psychopharmaceuticals. So where are we on that? Yeah, that, that's a, I'm glad you brought that up. And um, yeah, first of all, to that last point, that's absolutely the case. Um, many psychotherapy modalities, uh, their efficacy is just as high, if not higher, than pharmaceuticals. One example for uh, one case, for example, where, where it's almost certainly higher is with PTSD. Um, cognitive processing therapy, which is a particular flavor of CBT, uh, which stands for cognitive behavioral therapy, has better data than um, psychopharmaceuticals for the same condition. Those psychopharmaceuticals can help as well. Um, so it's undoubtedly extremely effective. The reason it's effective, I, I think, is not a mystery. There's been there's been quite a lot of good, like people in the psychotherapy world, um, can. I don't want to say tripped up, but I'll say can get tripped up about sort of the differences between different flavors of psychotherapy, from psychoanalysis, which is more Freudian, to CBT, which is a different approach, and saying these are sort of incompatible and completely different. Um, ways of looking at psychotherapy. Um, but most people, many people in their daily practice sort of like weave them together. And the reason they work across the different modalities is largely the same. It's what you just emphasized, which the fancy term for it is called therapeutic alliance. But the idea is that when you feel connected with another human being, which is again, therapeutic alliance, and you feel like that person is appreciating you in a holistic way, is listening to you and cares about you, you feel better. And that's that's it right there. Um, and that goes a long way for people, um, that connection. Um, in terms of sort of where are we now with it, it's with the sort of advent of psychopharmaceuticals and that being the sort of mainstay of treatment for many psychiatrists because of a lot of structural factors. These factors have to do with, for example, if you have an outpatient practice, you're incentivized by the pharmaceutical companies, by insurance companies, um, by your own desire to make a living, right, to see patients for a very short period of time, usually 15 to 20 minute visits. And if you're seeing a, a patient for that short period of time, it can be hard to connect in a psychotherapeutically beneficial way. And so what do you turn to in those cases? You turn to drugs, you turn to psychopharmaceuticals. And so there's an immense structural pressure for uh, your practicing psychiatrist to use drugs because they can see more patients, have higher volume, make more money um, than uh, providing sort of hour long or 45 minute long um, cognitive behavioral or psychodynamic psychotherapy sessions. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure. There, as a result, there's been a big push to sort of, in American psychiatry as a whole, to emphasize drug prescription over, um, over psychotherapy. And in addition to that, psychotherapy, in partly as a result of this phenomenon over the last uh, half century, psychotherapy increasingly has become the domain of psychologists um, and social workers who have either PhDs or um, li social work licenses 
uh, certification um, versus someone with a medical degree who's seen as a medical doctor prescribing medical, and these are scare quotes here, medical interventions like psychopharmaceuticals. Um, yeah, so that's that's more or less the the, the picture. Uh, I just want to mention Thomas Zaz, um, yes. S-Z-A-S-Z, -S -S for those Googling at home, who who's written many thoughtful things about about the way we treat people who are labeled abnormal, insane, crazy, whatever phrase you we've historically used. Now we say mentally ill. Um, but Zaz had a lot of provocative and interesting things to say about this, and, and I encourage people to read him and see if they find him of interest. But I, I want to make raise a question that whether we should be making a distinction here. So. Thoreau, in the 19th century, said the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Mm. So life is hard, even in um, our wealthy times compared to the past. It seems to be that people are not really much happier, maybe a lot less happy. Um, and I, to be cynical about it, I feel like the culture driven by the pharmaceutical industry has moved the goalposts for mental illness to include not just schizophrenia, but unhappiness, uh, sadness, yes. and then getting closer to more serious conditions, I would say dis the word I would use is despair. Mm -hmm. And obviously none of those are pleasant, none of them. Mm -hmm. um, and many people would like alleviation from any of those symptoms. You call mm. them moods. But would you make a distinction between somebody who struggles to get by day to day in a good mood with somebody who we would label schizophrenic, even if we mm -hmm. can't medically determine it? In other words, mm. if, yeah. you, if, you, if you've if you ever visited a psych ward, and I have as a exercise once, the people there are not just sad. They're right. They're they're struggling in ways you see them on the street in American yeah. cities. Now you see them, they're talking to themselves. They're uh, not, just, I talk to myself and I don't think I have these <laughs> yeah. problems. They're talking to themselves in ways that are deeply disturbing. They're yeah. shouting often. They're, they're, they're not functional in, in the literal sense that they can't hold a job and interact with people in a normal way, right. but they're deeply troubled. And, and yes. I would argue that that condition, which we used to lock those people up, for better or for worse, we don't anymore. We we quote, let them go. Um, hmm. And I think it's better and worse. But there's a difference, it seems to me, between the person on the street who is schizophrenic, even if we can't define that objectively or with a yes. with a biomarker, and somebody who's struggling to get by day to day and and finds c cigarettes, alcohol, Valium, you name it, a mm -hmm. comfort. Would you make mm -hmm. that distinction? And if so, yeah. how would how should we think about those more yes. extreme cases? Yeah, no, I think another really um, significant point is sort of the medicalization of kind of everyday suffering versus perhaps, um, which we've been talking about the pharmaceutical industry exploiting, et cetera, versus um, these more intense cases of um, psychological distress that certain people have. And I, I, I agree and believe in that. Um, and I think if you, if you sort of just look with humility about what have we learned in psychiatry over the last 150 years, and without being crazy optimistic or inflating our knowledge, just really what have we learned? We've learned in many ways through, through just observation of people that certain period, certain people periodically will have certain states over the course of their lives that are very distressing. These states can be what we call like mania, for example. And then we call people um, with people who have uh, mania, we say have uh, bipolar disorder, but it's a very particular state that has been observed consistently over time in many different settings by mental health professionals in certain um, populations, right? Um, and we know some things about it because we've observed it for so many years, right? We know that if you've had one, 
you're likely to have another one that they tend to become more intense over time, these manic states. Um, it can be, and we could say something similar, I think, as, as you've been suggesting for psychosis um, and, you know, people who have uh, uh, episodes of, of psychosis, we would say have schizophrenia now. But we know some things that there are these certain states that people become extremely distressed in, they become less functional, they're unable to do the things in their life that they want to accomplish. Um, in many ways, you can see mental illness really as someone's on a particular life trajectory, right? And then once one of these states happens, usually all of a sudden things start going in a drastically different direction. Um, and because we've observed it for so many years, we know some of the characteristics of what usually plays out when we've seen this given state. Um, so I think that's, that's undoubtedly, I, I think that's undoubtedly the case. And I think it is important to sort of distinguish those two things because we can also, people who are going through these experiences, whether it's psychosis or whether it's mania, we can confidently tell them some of what they might expect for the rest of their lives, some of what might help them in the sort of shorter term. Sometimes it'll involve medication, sometimes it won't. Um, yeah, so I, I think, and I, I just think that's a really, yeah, I, I'm glad you brought it up because I think it's, it's, it's a really significant point. And I think it is something that is an important role for psychiatrists to sort of trying to suss out and distinguish these different things. Now, the issue is, I've said all this about sort of, you know, there, there are these different conditions that we've observed over time. It's a completely different question is, does the mental health system, as it's currently constructed or as it has in the past, does it actually help those people who I've been describing? Does it help the situation? Does it make them worse? And, and in many ways, if we look at the history of psychiatric confinement, the, the goal in most cases was not for the sake of the patient, right? Like that's not, it wasn't for the care of the patient, even if it was sometimes put in those terms, if you look at it socially, um, going back, you know, to the 16th century, but on through the sort of 19th century, um, it wasn't for the care of the patient that people were confined. It was the care, uh, it was the care of society at large, the quote unquote, normal people, right, who didn't want to be walking down the street and see someone who was mumbling or, or what have you, right? Um, and so because of that social function of the mental health system itself, um, it, it leads to a lot of problems where, yes, we know that these sort of conditioning exist and they, and they repeat in a certain way and we, we potentially can help these groups of people. But the sociopolitical function of psychiatry, and this is what Thomas Saas talks a lot about, over time, and this is the part of Saas that I really, I really think is useful, has been to um, label people who don't fit into society in a particular way as being pathological and then to confine that group of people and separate them from society. And that, for me, is where you start to get into problematic territory. Um, it's, it's the sort of social and political function of psychiatry as a way of sort of separating marginalized and labeling people. Um, for example, you might ask, you know, we sort of, we have noticed these states over time, right? Mania and that psychosis that you mentioned. Can we imagine a society where like people who were occasionally manic and psychotic, would it be fun? You know, there would be a way for society outside of confining them to sort of treat them, interact with them, care for them. Might it also, and this is a lot of the, you know, Saz was writing in the 1970s, and there's a lot of other writers at the time who were asking these sorts of questions. In other societies, are these psychotic states actually seen as something that's beneficial, right? And increasingly, some of the here is some of the research that's happening on auditory hallucinations, which for a long time in psychiatry was, was seen as sort of a telltale marker of psychosis. It's increasingly coming out that a lot of people hear voices and a lot of people hear voices and don't have a lot of the other symptoms we associate with schizophrenia. And in fact, they're, they're hearing voices for them is a, uh, is a rich part of their life. 
that sort of helps them cope with what's going on in the world. And they also, in many cases, believe can help others um, through a variety of, of mechanisms. So while I do feel like, you know, particularly mania and psychosis are things that we've sort of observed over time in people and we know some things about, that that does not mean necessarily that we should treat them as pathological and worthy of confinement, even though that's the way that psychiatry has approached them in the past. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, Zaz writes about lots of interesting things related to this, including in the Soviet Union, the use of medical diagnosis to medicalize dissidents and to confine right. them in, in tragic and cruel ways. But I think the fundamental question that you raise is the, which is unanswerable, is to the people who suffer from these manias and these psychoses, what do they want? And of course, mm. which they are you talking about? The ones that are manic or the ones when they're not manic? And um, if you've read the beautiful Mo A Beautiful Mind uh, by Sylvia Nasser or seen the the movie, uh, you know, John Nash uh, turned down, I think, uh, offered to be chair of uh, a department of mathematics because he said he was busy being emperor of Antarctica. And he meant it very seriously. And he's one of the greatest minds, you know, of his time. Right. And so he, he was he was living in an alternative reality to the people around him and they were very right. uncomfortable with it. Uh, and as they tried to cope with it, in ways that you referred to earlier, um, they drew the line at shock treatments. You know, they did not right. want his brain damaged to make him more pleasant to be around uh, or right. quote more realistic. And then he had a a period where he's was not suffering from those symptoms. And so, you know, how we should deal with that, how how we as families should deal with that, we as a community, as a society, as a nation. Uh, those are really, really hard questions, but it seems to me those are the questions we ought to be talking about, Absolutely. thinking about. Um, can I, can uh, I just push back on one point, just, just sure. a little, which yeah. is, it was just, just the notion that it's unknowable, because I think, I think in some ways you're right, you're, you're sort of pointing toward the, the difficulty with these big, big picture questions, but in the, in another way, there are plenty of people with schizophrenia who have a lot to say about how we should be treating schizophrenia. And right. we should, that perspective has not been represented in the sort of structures that we've made to handle mental illness in our country throughout its history, because, precisely because of all this sort of um, social marginalization we've been talked about, and because they've been so marginalized, this population in this community, people with lived experience of mental illness, that it never occurred to the quote unquote experts to actually talk to them about what sorts of modalities they might actually find to be healing. And so, you know, I would encourage, and I have got, uh, uh, and this is a genuine offer. I know people with uh, lived experience of mental illness who have a lot to say about how they would like to be treated. Um, and I'd be happy to connect you with them because uh, I work with some of them. Some of them are community organizers here in Connecticut who are working with like the Department of Mental Health Services in Connecticut to reimagine how mental health is delivered specifically in this state. Um, but that's a first, that's a concrete first step is bringing that community into the conversation, centering people who have lived experience of this so that we can know how should we be doing this differently? Yeah, I, I'm very sympathetic that I, and I, at the same time, I, I don't think we should, I don't want to roman romanticize mental illness, which there's a strong cultural mm. uh, thread that does that. I, one, of, one of my favorite movies used to be um, The King of Hearts, which is, uh, you could argue, is a, a, um, a fable about insanity. And the, th the theme right. of that fable is that the insane are the sane ones and the sane ones are the insane yes. ones because they don't, right. they think the world we live in is normal. So I, yeah, I think you have to be careful in, and I don't like that movie anymore. I think that um, romanticizes mental illness and mm -hmm. I, you, I don't want to criticize the creators of it. It's a fable. It's a metaphor. I, you know, it's okay. Sure. But um, at the same time, we have, it's, it's a tricky, uh, it's a very 
challenging thing to think about who the real you is in various states and you know what you want in different states. But but my default is certainly to agree with you that the people who suffer from these in these situations should be the first person who we listen to. And it's not just that they weren't the first, most of the time they were never listened to. So I'm very That's sympathetic right. to that, that encouragement. Before we leave this topic, I just want to mention one thing in your article that your essay that I found surprising and just mm. for my ignorance, which is I sort of assumed that, you know, schizophrenia was one thing that, well, maybe depression and, and other things right. that we might struggle to objectively measure with a biomarker, but surely schizophrenia is a genetic disease. It runs, quote, runs in families, and and yet you suggest that it's so much more complicated than that. So just say something brief about that, and then I want to turn to a, to a different question. Yeah, and that that's very common to see sort of schizophrenia as a, as a hard, like, biological disease in a way that some of these others aren't. I will point out that right as my article was coming out, there, there was um, – some research into the genetics of, of schizophrenia that looks um, somewhat promising. And I got a lot of tweets from that community <laughs> when my article came out, which I welcome, obviously. Um, I'm not against biological breakthroughs by any, mean, uh, by any means, but I am interested in the, uh, in the question of what constitutes a breakthrough. And even with these somewhat recent, um, still tentative advances from my understanding of, of sort of being able to use these sort of GWAS technologies, which basically, and again, I'm no geneticist, but just to sort of break it down, there was a hope for a while that we would just find a gene associated with a particular condition, right? That would be very clean. Uh, there's other, you know, medical illnesses that sort of follow that model. We can say there's this genetic mutation. It results in this change in phenotype, which is the illness. Um, that is not panned out in terms of schizophrenia or bi bipolar disorder. So then we sort of turn to this GWAS strategy, which is basically a way, as far as I understand it, it might give my understanding somewhat limited, of uh, looking at a variety of genes, sometimes in the case hundreds and thousands, and showing how across all of those genes, particular changes can increase or decrease your risk for a particular condition. Um, so there has been some advancement along those lines. I'm told by the genetics community, but still, and, and this is after going back and forth with some of them, we are miles away from that resulting in any kind of biomarker. And I will state again, as I brought up before, and I, again, I hope we get biomarkers. I would love to have biomarkers, but this thing has happened many, many times across history where there's some sort of advance, right? There's some promising thing that happens. And then there's this big, you know, reaction to it. Oh, you know, this is the breakthrough. This is the turning point, et cetera. And it just doesn't pan out. And at some point you've been, uh, I, I like uh, a lot of your sort of references to um, art and film. And I think of like waiting for Godot. Um, it feels like we're waiting for this sort of biological Godot. And at some point, we need to stop just waiting, I think. I think it's, you know, there should still be research on, uh, on this front, but at some point, if we have a limited number of research dollars, then we need to start diversifying and we need to stop putting all of our eggs in this one basket and stop just sort of waiting for this biological Godot that may never show up. Yeah, we should put it all in, in um, psychedelics, right? Yeah, exactly. Because that's the latest. Yeah, that's another, yeah, that magic. is the latest. Oh, that is the latest magic, without a doubt. And it is, it is, um, the enthusiasm that I'm seeing uh, around it here at Yale in particular, um, there's research on psilocybin, there's uh, research that's coming out in certain corners on drugs like ayahuasca, on DMT, which is the active ingredient in uh, peyote. Um, uh, in MDMA uh, for a variety of conditions, which is commonly recreationally called ecstasy. Again, we should note, you know, I was talking about recreational versus medical. This is another example of that sort of boundary crossing. And I think in many ways, this is the same story we've been talking about. And this is what I worry about. People talk about this being a massive breakthrough and a turning point. And 
yes, these drugs may help people as they have in the recreational setting for a long time for certain people who have enjoyed using them and feel like they give them insight into their life. But what we're really seeing here in many ways is the same story that we saw in the 1950s with Milltown, where you have pharmaceutical companies realizing that they can sort of capitalize on this enthusiasm for psychedelics and creating markets. And then and with that comes all the problems that we've been talking about before with lack of access to care, et cetera. Um, and the, the other thing that I sort of just noticed with this recent psychedelic boom, and this is what I talk a lot about in the article, is that psychiatry has just been so susceptible to hype over time. Um, it's, just, it's just unbelievable to me. If you look at now with psychedelics in the 1980s with the biological turn, in the 1920s with these new psychosomatic interventions that were extremely violent, but won Nobel Prizes, right, in the 1920s and 30s. At each of these moments, there's just this overwhelming, unabashed, unscientific in many ways um, hype around these substances without us just taking a pause and just saying, okay, these are substances just like any other. Let's see what they do. But this hype it, the reason this hype keeps repeating itself is because uh, is for a lot of reasons. But I think if you look at the interest it serves, it serves the interests of pharmaceutical companies who are now going to be able to profit on these uh, substances that have been many of which have been used by indigenous communities for uh, thousands of years. But now they're able to sort of patent uh, through various means that I can talk more about and profit from. And it's also helping academic psychiatrists who are going to be able to build careers on this, on this hype. Um, and so that's why the hype, I think, keeps repeating itself. But I think it is, it, it is time to sort of try, try not to get swept in the hype um, quite as much. Yeah, I'm 68. <clears throat> it's taken me a long time to, to reduce my susceptibility to hype. I'm, I'm not there yet, but I'm making <laughs> some progress. And when you talk about that, the psychedelics, I realize... Oh yeah, this is just like those other things. Yours, you give examples from psychiatry. For me, it's more like Theranos, driverless cars. There, yes, there's a absolutely. There's there's a uh, I would call it uh, messianic, and I and I say that with respect as a religious person. But mm -hmm. human beings have a messianic desire for redemption. We're going to solve this. The idea that it can't be solved is unbearable. That's out of the question. Of course, mm -hmm. if we haven't solved it, yeah, it's just a matter of time. And mm -hmm. you, Dr. Ramos, with your, your pessimism and cynicism, shame on you. We should yep. always be hoping that this is the turning point. And of course, you're a human being. You realize that it could be. <laughs> but, but, but let's reserve judgment, probably, um, at least yeah. for now. Um, Absolutely. Let's, let's turn to the uh, title of your piece because um, – I confessed recently that uh, this recent interview hasn't aired yet on um, peer review that I've always thought, sure, peer review is awful, but we just have to fix it. And then it suddenly, thanks to Adam Mastriani, we should imagine maybe it's not fixable. And yeah. and your your piece reminds me of that kind of outside the box thinking, which is surprisingly difficult. Um, so here's an area where enormous amount of 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 human suffering and enormous potential to help people. The idea that it's not in your brain is so jarring. Uh, and certainly the episode with Johan Hari, he takes a similar approach uh, to his own suffering uh, and to these kind of questions. And it's a radical idea. The radical idea is that maybe, and, and a thoughtful scientific person has to entertain this radical idea because at least the crude evidence is that many societies don't suffer from these problems. Mm -hmm. This Many of these problems appear to be what we would call first world or modern problems. Mm. Um, depression does not, it could be a definitional problem, diagnostic problem, but depression does not seem to be common in uh, among people who are not uh, of the modern era, whether they're mm. currently living now or in the past. And, Again, I don't want to romanticize those communities. They had different, they had other problems, but it does make you wonder uh, why it is that in one of the richest societies and one of the richest times, uh, depression is on the rise 
And you can say, well, that's just a diagnostic change. Suicide's on the rise uh, among young people, as far as I understand it. Something has gone wrong. It's in, untenable when you think about it, when you step outside all the cultural baggage we have around mental illness. It's untenable that it's just the mm-hmm. fact that brains aren't working as well as they used to. That is literally a non-scientific hypothesis. It cannot be maintained. I could, so you, yeah, have, you, I, have an ex- you have an explanation. I'm going to disagree with it, but give us your explanation. <laughs> so, I, uh, yes. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of, because I, this is such a big picture conversation, I'm going to sort of bring it down to a particular case, which is here at, the university where I teach at Yale, um, and a very the very serious matter of suicide, um, which is something that uh, has happened among students here, obviously, but also is an issue, as you've been saying, in young people generally, particularly, um, and, and this tends to get more media attention, but it's an issue more broadly at sort of these uh, uh, elite academic institutions. And this question emerges like, you know, how could someone who's got everything to look forward to um, turn to something like that? There must be something wrong with them, right? That is sort of the the underlying assumption. And then the next position is they, why couldn't they get access to mental health care? So that's sort of our reflexive script that we run down. There's suicide. There was something wrong with them. Why didn't they get access to mental health care? And I want to push back on that script. And I want to suggest that in many ways, and there's been this big push at this university in response to some of the high profile suicides. And I don't know if you saw the Washington Post piece on how depression is treated here at Yale. And in case um, your listeners can look if they want more information. But there's been this big push to expand access to mental health services for the student. And For students. And again, who couldn't agree with that? Who couldn't agree with more mental health services? But what I really feel, and this is something that I actually unpack with students in my seminar on madness, on the history of madness, is that this immediate push to increase access to mental health services is also a way of ignoring the actual reasons structurally, socially, culturally, that people are feeling sick at an institution that is supposed to be so privileged like Yale. And so what if, instead of just demanding access to individualized care where you're likely gonna get a psychopharmaceutical and you're likely gonna get some therapy in the most ideal circumstances, what if in addition to that, I'm not saying we shouldn't provide individuals with care, what if in addition to that, we had a serious conversation about what is it in this culture that is making people ill? How can we move beyond the question of access to start to ask collectively what is happening in our micro society here that people are feeling so sick that sometimes they feel the only way out is suicide, right? And that that's, those same dynamics are affecting all sorts of other people in less dramatic ways that don't necessarily result in that, right? But are still affecting people nevertheless. Um, and the issue that I have with this sort of focus on access to mental health care and then this focus, like, which is sort of built into that with the, the illness is in that person's brain who took their life, right, is that it forecloses a deeper examination of what is it about this place that is making, that is, it, it, to put it technically, pathogenic, right? What is it about this, lar- this larger culture that we're sitting in? that is making us ill and what, what, what might we do about it? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's incredibly sad to me. I, I, um, I think, um, you know, economists don't like to talk about this. They would say, Oh, this is outside economics. It's not relevant. Um, you know, we talk about incentives, we talk about well-being, though. We pretend to. We pretend to talk about people maximizing their well-being, and we assume it's connected to their material access to material goods. Certainly, people at both ends of the material well-being spectrum, the 
top, let's say 20%, 10%, 5% at one end versus the people at, in the bottom, at the bottom who are facing a despair of a different kind. Both groups are in despair to me. Um, yeah. And I think your insight is profound. Um, I, I I feel the same way about about the tragedy of 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 mass shootings. We have a conversation about drug about yes. gun control that's very formulaic, but for some reason we cannot have a conversation about why it is that someone finds it compelling to kill strangers. I, yeah, something has gone. I mean, deeply wrong. You could imagine it happening once, twice, but for it to happen occasionally as it does now in America is not a statement about gun control. It, you could argue it's very similar, by the way, to the pharmaceutical point for me, and I'm, this may offend people, I don't know, but you know, whether we understand brain chemistry or not, we understand that pharm some pharmaceuticals can help some people. Similarly, whatever causes mass shootings we could debate whether gun control of various kinds could could mitigate the consequences mm -hmm. of of these events but it does not ask what to me is the real question which is not how do we keep guns out of the hands of people uh while maintaining our first amendment rights second amendment rights excuse me but rather what has come to the world that this mm -hmm. is considered um normal and yeah. it's not for me, it's not much different from asking, you know, wh why is it uh, we can we can debate what should be done about people living in tents on the sidewalks of American cities, and but but you do have to think about a thoughtful person should be thinking about how do we get to this point where someone thinks that's a a, a reasonable lifestyle, and, mm -hmm. and 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 that you could argue again i don't want to roman i'm never going to romanticize that but you can argue there's something beautiful about the fact that we let people live that lifestyle we don't arrest them like we used to not only do we not arrest them we don't put them in mental institutions where we put drugs mm. into them against their will or give them shock treatment but the idea that we don't look at the underlying problem right it is bizarre yeah it is it is and in increasingly and just to build on your example of sort of gun control and mass shootings mental health always emerges in these conversations and that to me is the most absurd of the uses of mental health mental just i mean i i feel like i have to state this explicitly even though it should be obvious but psychiatrists cannot predict when someone is going to commit suicide or when someone is going to kill someone. We have tried over many, many years to figure that out, and we are nowhere closer. They have done rigorous studies that have shown that we are just unable to do it. And part of the reason is that these are just such rare events. They're very difficult to predict. They're so contingent, et cetera. Um, and our science isn't that great as we've been discussing in the, in the, in the first place. But Nevertheless, and, and this happens on sort of the, across the political divide, on sort of liberals asking for more mental health care to conservatives, and it's, it's a similar gut reaction, this cultural script that there's this larger social issue, there needs to be more mental health. And to me, that forecloses the conversation that you're trying to get at, which is what is more broadly going on here, Right. What is happening as a society that's making this response, whether it's mass shootings or homelessness or suicide, possible, sensible, the, the thing that someone feels like they need to do? What, what's happening at a broader level? And act, mental health just gets sort of slapped on there. It's like, oh, we just increase, we hire some more psychiatrists, hire some more psychologists, and we're good. And the problem is, and this is, this is one of the issues I think that is unfortunate is that psychiatrists and psychologists often don't get up and say, we can't fix that problem. Why and would they? <laughs> exactly. Better not to. Exactly. Because it's more money, it's more jobs, et cetera. And we're our, I mean, and, and this is no knock on a lot of practitioners who are feeling like they don't have the capacity to treat all the patients that they want to treat, right? So they welcome more resources, et cetera.
but I'm just sort of, so I'm not trying to demonize anyone. What I'm trying to do is just explain how the system perpetuates your, itself, where it's politically um, expeditious for politicians as well as administrators in universities to, instead of doing a deep dive into the culture, to sort of say, okay, I can just hire some more psychiatrists and psychologists, right? I can just expand access to mental health care. And then on the other side, with the practitioners, it makes it's good on their end. And so it just becomes this, this script that's gotten so embedded where people just sort of assume that mental health is going to fix things when access to mental health services is just not. I mean, all these, all these examples we're talking about are, are where I would suggest the solution to a social problem is palliative. Mm. It, it's, um, it's let's reduce the consequences of this rather than get at the root cause. And I think you have to ask, <clears throat> why are we so uncomfortable thinking about the root cause? And I think, uh, you and I have different answers. You want to put, uh, I think, some of the burden on capitalism. And mm. I, I want you to defend that. I don't agree with you, but why don't you make that case? And then I'll give it an alternative view and we'll see if we have any common ground. Well, what we sure. share clearly is a view that although palliative care is better than no care at all, it's not the effective or holistic way of getting at the problem. Yeah. And I think that I, I like the way you're framing that is that sort of palliative care that we can see mental health in many ways is palliative, but we need to be honest in framing it in those terms. That That's really what it is. It's helping people cope with something that they are grappling with in their life in a particular way it can provide some sort of ease of suffering, but it's not on its own, or at least as it's conceived of currently in the United States. There are other ways of looking at mental illness from the past and through history uh, in other settings outside of the United States, like in Latin America, as well as um, Africa in sort of post-colonial contexts, where mental health has specifically been linked to political and social mobilization, and in certain contexts, they would consider liberation. Um, and so part of my research and the, the book that I'm writing is sort of looking at the history, the history of what was called liberation psychiatry in Latin America in the 1970s. And it's, it starts with a very simple idea, which is that you cannot be mentally, you, can, you can't have mental health unless you're liberated from the social structures that are making you sick. And if that's the case, then there needs to be this palliative work, as you put it, that you're talking where you sort of support, support the person who's being made ill by these larger uh, social structures. But there also needs to be political work on, on the part of the practitioner with their patients to resist, to liberate them from the things that are making them sick in society. And th this still happens, you know, I, I talk about in the 1970s, but part of the reason I'm interested in it is because it's still happening in certain uh, groups today. And I can give uh, a variety of examples, but one, for example, was a uh, train crash that happened in Argentina, where a lot of my research occurs in 2014. Um, and it was essentially uh, a product of the fact that the, uh, the, the, um, the new government was disinvesting from uh, state resources. And so the trains became very unsafe and the trains tend to um, mostly uh, be commuter rails for the poor. And so there was this horrible train accident. And after the fact, the mental health professionals who I work with um, had these sort of group therapy sessions with the families who had been effective, where they provided this sort of support, palliative care for what had happened. But then these group therapy sessions built into political action that not everyone participated in, but many people did, and they came from this sort of therapeutic setting where they organized and actually demanded that the trains uh, be, you know, that there be reinvestment in the train system, et cetera, um, and that there be reparations to these families who had lost a lot of income from having wage earners who were, who were killed in the train accident, et cetera. 
And not only that, the, the, the last sort of the way this loop completes, I think, in many ways, is that not only was the political action in many ways effective, uh, unevenly so, but in, in many ways effective in getting certain services for this uh, community that had been uh, affected, but also psychologically, the process of politically organizing to speak back to the thing that had hurt you was psychologically therapeutic, right? And it, it seems very obvious, but it's not something, I, I was not trained to do that as a psychiatrist, you know, here in this country, right? I had to go to, to, to a different, completely different place to even understand how I might connect sort of the care that I pro- provide to an individual patient to these broader sort of social and political factors through my work as a practitioner. To even to be, even be able to conceptualize that, I had to go to a different place because it's so far outside the way that at least psychiatry is taught uh, in this country. Yeah, and I, <clears throat> again, I think, I think that if I remember correctly, that's a theme in Johan Hari's book. <clears throat> and, and my pushback mm-hmm. there is similar to my pushback here, especially if you made a more broad critique of, of say, um, any modern society and, and its reliance on market processes or other situations uh, that we, we might call capitalism. I, I, it seems the alternative is, uh, is, is simpler, although I don't want to say it's therefore true. It's not. I'm not going to use Occam's razor here, but a, a more a simple, we don't have more capitalism uh, than we had 50 years ago. We have, you could argue we have less. We could dispute that. But that's not what I want to talk about. But I think what we do have more of is loneliness. Um, mm-hmm. And we have at our heart of our popular culture today, a device that I used to um, celebrate and I still love using, which is my phone. And I see um, it. you don't have to be a, uh, a deep social critic or a deep social observer to see what the smartphone has done to human interaction in wealthy c- countries. Um, there's less. And I, you know, I think back to your comment about cognitive behavioral therapy, so interacting with another human being is, is healthy. Uh, we're social creatures. We're social creatures who like meaning and purpose. And the beauty of that post train wreck set of actions is that it combined combining with a group of people to achieve something that was meaningful and purposeful and and deeply powering, empowering, I'm sure, to the people involved. And for whatever reason, uh, there's less of that in in the modern world, it seems to me. And and two obvious things that have changed are God is dead and the family seems to be dying. And those are the two things that through most of human history gave people meaning and purpose. A family, their children, their grandparents, whatever it was, and their 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 religion. If those things go away, it, it might be hard to keep mental health for human beings that evolved under different set of circumstances. So I'm open to the reality that say globalization caused despair in certain parts of the world uh, and that people can't cope with it or don't want to cope with it and they've turned to other things. But it seems pretty clear to me and I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of personal choice. So I don't really want to restrict choice. I don't want to ban phones and I don't want to constrain them in certain ways. But we, we have a problem. It, this, it seems to me to be so out, so obvious and Maybe well, when I say these things, my younger listeners say, oh, you're just old, you don't understand. But, you know, I think human beings don't connect with each other as much as they used to. Mm-hmm. Now, one, the, the optimistic take on that is that, well, they'll fig- we'll figure out new ways to do that. And we do connect. And I mean, I connect to people on Twitter in wonderful ways. You and I are two strangers. We're connecting over a podcast and people are listening and, and relating to us in, in imperfect, but pretty cool ways. Uh, but it seems to me we have a we have a loneliness problem. Mm. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think 
Uh, I, there's a lot of what you said, and I and I'm, I'm torn because I want to address the capitalism bit, but I also want to go speak, ahead. No, take yeah, a shot yeah, at yeah. it. <laughs> speak to the loneliness. I just don't want to forget. So I'll start with the the loneliness though. Um, and and what is it, what is sort of embedded in that question, which is our sort of evolving relationship to technology and how technology has changed the way that we relate to ourselves and the way that we relate to each other. And that we need to sort of pay attention to and track how it's making new connections possible, but also the ways in which it might be foreclosing certain kinds of like meaningful um, action. And this, I don't have much more to say on that than this is something we need to be paying particular attention to right now. Specifically, you're seeing sort of uh, with the advent of artificial um, intelligence and like chat GTP, which like is 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 blowing up, whether the notion that like artificial intelligence um, could, for example, uh, provide therapy. Right. Sure. And there's 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 now been a study. This just uh, popped up on my Twitter feed. Um, where they blinded people to whether they were talking to a real person or they were talking to a robot in the in uh, not a robot, sorry, a uh, chat GTP. And um, chat GTP was instructed to sort of provide empathy, et cetera. And it was the chat GTP responses were supervised by a human versus a human. And they sort of compared the two and they found that um, chat GTP was faster and that the users tended to rate the chat GTP responses supervised by a human being as being more effective, more empathetic than the actual human responses. Well, they and, would find that or, or it wouldn't be publishable. So we, let's remember there's some, there's some publication bias here probably. But yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, absolutely. But it's provocative. It's provocative. And, and, and I, I don't mean to say that this is a sort of fact, um, but the, the one other the sort of intriguing, I'm more interested in this as sort of a cultural phenomenon that I think increasingly these are the sorts of questions that people are asking. And this is the direction I think that a lot of research is going to be pushing. Um, but w when people found out that the responses were actually coming from, you know, uh, AI, obviously they are or perhaps not, obviously they, they no longer felt like they, they can continue to receive, you know, uh, care through the, 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 um, chat GTP. So it's, it's, this is something that we're going to need to look at because there's a lot of financial interest in deepening our relationship, our social relationship to the technologies that we have and increasingly finding more and more meaning in those spaces than in connection with the human beings around us. There's a lot of financial pressure there, um, relate, you know, ranging from sort of the mental health realm where I practice to sort of everyday life, as you're saying. And we, we need to be critical of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I have used chat GPT a little bit and it's really interesting and fascinating. I'm, we had a recent conversation with Ian Leslie about it. Listeners can check out, but I find myself saying, please, which is funny, right? Yeah. I say, please yeah. tell me blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I could imagine an avatar on screen uh, that when I was telling my troubles to that being, not sentient in my view, but some would argue it could become sentient that it could be programmed to cry and, and show mm -hmm. empathy, mm -hmm. and show what I would take as empathy. Wouldn't yes. be empathy I, in my view, but it may, maybe it'll work, quote, just as well or almost as well, or it's a placebo, it'll fool me, I, I want to be fooled, it's cheaper, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, you're right, though, that it's really important for people to keep in mind the financial stakes that are involved between real people and and not real people in, in – um, in this area. But now do you want to say something about capitalism? Yeah. Um, and I mean, this get, gets to that point. I feel like in this, in this entire conversation, we've been talking about how the financial pressure um, exerts itself on our sort of overall desire as human beings to find well-being in our life and the way that it can alienate us from that. And just as a psychiatric pra practitioner, um, it's, 
you know, talking about how being constrained to sort of uh, have short visits where we're prescribing medication instead of meaningfully connecting with people leads to high, high rates of burnout where people come into this profession to try to help people. And then as they start to practice, they're finding that they're not fi- they're not having the sort of meaningful connection that they assumed. And then they look at their bank account and they're hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Uh, and they don't feel like there's a way out. They're sort of trapped into this particular situation. And this is a product of, in many ways, all of these financial interests that we're talking about. So it's, you know, I'm less interested in sort of the counterfact. I mean, I think it is important to ask what their alternatives there might be, but I don't think we should just use that as an excuse. There's no alternative in this sort of like Tina uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher uh, mode to say there's no alternative. So this is the way things must be. Um, and I think if you go down that route, that's just a way of justifying uh, an unsavory status quo. Uh, I think we need to be asking how things can be better. I think we need to be pushing on sort of the uh, financial interests that are constraining our well being. Um, And if we're not doing that, we're just going to continue to pump people full of pharmaceuticals and uh, instead of actually looking at the broader um, the broader cultures that that's making people sick. Actually, I think we don't have enough capitalism, but and I mean that very seriously, I think the the dysfunctionality of a lot of what we observe around us. Is partly not completely due to the way we have distorted the market signals of profit and loss. I think, I mean, just take the simplest of examples. The idea that Medicare can't negotiate Mm. a pharmaceutical price, that they are legislatively forbidden to negotiate price is, I don't know. I don't know what to say about it, but but I call that crony capitalism. But you, that's a, might be a labeling difference, but but it's um, where we agree, I think, is that I think it's really powerful to remember that the status quo is not the only choice. And, um, right. yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think, I think that's right. It might, it, in, in many ways, it, it might be a labeling difference, uh, perhaps, but I think the broader point for me and sort of, I, I, this conversation has been really helpful for sort of clarifying this for me is that we need to start thinking about our mental, and this gets back to the title that you can coming back to, which I I, was not mine. It was actually Matt Lord, the editors, which is a brilliant title. Um, But that mental illness is not in your head. So then where is it? We need to start thinking about mental illness as something that is a relationship with our broader social, political, and cultural world. And until we start doing that, we're going to continue to sort of just per- perpetuate this psychopharmaceutical system that we've been critiquing throughout this conversation. I guess today has been Marco Ramos. Marco, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you so much for having me, Russ. Really enjoyed it. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.